Hey y'all, welcome back to Better Tomorrow. I just want to first say thank you so much for supporting the launch last week, listening to episode one and two. It was so great to see how much you guys are loving it, uh, giving me feedback on what you love, what you would like to hear. It means the world to me. Uh, I was so nervous uh, leading up to last week. I don't know, there's just a lot of nerves of wondering what y'all are going to think and I, as soon as the episodes were out and you guys were listening, give me feedback. I just felt like, oh, okay, I can do this. This week we have Jamie Lynn Spears on and I'm so excited for y'all to get to know a little bit more about her. Jamie Lynn and I met when we both uh, were a part of Special Forces together. I don't want to say competed because it was definitely not competing against each other. It was such a social experiment and we got to learn about each other in such a unique way. You don't get to know people that intensely in such a short amount of time in anything in the real world, <laughs> for sure. And so when I was thinking about people that I wanted on that I felt like had a bigger story than I feel like what was out there, Jamie Lynn was the first to come to mind because I definitely had some pre- conceived conceptions about who she is and she was one of the people in my life that I can say made me have a complete 180 um, once I got to know them about what I believe to be true about who they are and their character and we definitely get to see that I feel like in this conversation of just how just open and kind and authentic she is and definitely authentic I will say because um <laughs> Jamie Lynn is like the best mom ever and took the time out of her busy, like, I think it was weekend. I can't remember when we actually did this. I don't know. It was a bit a busy week for her because her daughter is really into softball. And so she took this call in her car at the ballpark in between two games. Uh, she's a great teammate uh, in all ways with me and cheering on her daughter and all that she does. So in saying that, the quality of the video might not be the best this week. So hang in there if you're watching on YouTube. The audio, I think, should be pretty clear. But if there are little moments, like this was filmed in a car at the ballpark. I'm just thankful that she was able to come on the podcast. And I think what we talk about is really great. It was one of, it was one of those episodes that made me laugh and cry truly. Uh, it was so, so fun, and I think y'all are going to enjoy it. So here she is, Jamie Lynn Spears. Jamie Lynn, I'm so happy that you're here today, and I love that you're in your car at your daughter's softball game doing this. So thank well, you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing me to have this beautiful backdrop but still get to talk to you. <laughs> I love it because you're so yourself and this, it's refreshing and um, I wouldn't want it any other way. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so you are, I just kind of want to start out with, we, I feel very connected to you just because you are a fellow Southern girl. You grew yeah. up in Mississippi, raised in Louisiana, right? Well, or actually, te technically my address <clears throat> was always in Louisiana. But we lived okay. like I could see the state line and I went to school in Mississippi. So, oh, OK. Yeah. OK. Well, I I I'm from Alabama and I identify as a redneck. Does that do you identify as a redneck? A little? Yes, I mean, I, I think like you can't help but kind of just have like you'll be it's weird how like I can go into the, these fancy places. But then like I fly home and next thing I know, like we're out in the yard, you know, getting our four wheeler on stuff or whatever it is, you know, yes. it's just kind of like and I feel like really another word for a redneck is just that like we just can get really inventive and like figure out what we need to do. It might not look pretty. It might not look fancy, but we get it done, you know? Yeah. We know how to rig it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, I just have redneck tendencies, but same, like I can dress up, I can do, uh, you know, the elite things, but I think the most fun is when you're like make your makeshift water slot, like, water slide oh, yeah. into a river like that that is fun yes it's very much the kind of lifestyle that we are 
um, our neighbors, actually, we get to like drive across the cow field and we just ride, you know, you got to close the gates, the cows don't get out and we drive over to their house and our kids get to play. And like, to me, that, that's like, those are like core memories that my kids will have. And I hope they hold on to because that's like a childhood, like going outside across the field to your friend's house. It's like, those are things that I'm so happy that I still get to have for my children. Cause I grew up that way too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you saying that story about going and crossing with the cows, not letting the cows out actually brings me to special forces and us first meeting. And I will n- never forget on that train on the way uh, when they started like bombing us or whatever. And you are talking about that. We thought you were talking about a hawk, but you were talking about yeah. a hog. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, they were like, wait a minute, your mom shot a hawk? I was like, no. I was like, what? like a hog. I couldn't figure out why nobody was understanding what I was saying because I was like, in the South, like there were these huge hogs that were tearing up my mother's land. So they had to catch them. So she had like cages out there, you know? And I mean, people thought I was saying hawk, I guess because of my accent. And so they just thought my mom was like out there like catching hawks. I was like, no, was it was dumb. hogs. I was so confused. It wasn't also your accent. I think you were like sick. Remember you had like yeah. a really, really raspy voice. So we couldn't understand what you were saying. Voice. Our- <laughs> remember, I did not have a voice. They left that part out. I the show. They don't tell you that. Us all, like you're telling this story and I'm concerned. I'm like, how is, is that? I think it's illegal. <laughs> And everybody, like their, everybody's faces were the same as mine. And then I think somebody was like, wait, are you saying, you're saying hawk? And you're like, no, a hog, like a pig. And we were like, oh, okay. But I, that was just. Big difference. That was, that was the fun. Uh, I want to say that I just so enjoyed having that experience with you on Special Forces. And out of any person I think I've ever met, uh, going in with a preconceived notion of somebody like you are my example to never do that because I had a full 180 from my experience with you. And I think a lot, I remember a lot of the recruits being like having the same, like, Hey, I want to apologize because you're actually one of the coolest, nicest, humble, authentic down to earth people I've ever met. And um, I'm just so thankful that I got to experience that with you. And, um, I think everybody else on the show feels the same way. Well, thank you for saying that. And I think that like, especially, you know, in our business, a lot of our story and our narrative is created by the press or the media. We really don't have that much control. You know, we have our little bit here on social media, but they could shut that down. And so I think that especially growing up in this business from such a young age, a lot of people have told my story and my narrative. And when you're young, you just assume I'm a kid. That's what's supposed to happen. And so I think that really over the past few years, it's just been really important for me to do a show like Special Forces, which is so out of my character, unscripted, doing these challenges, because I need to have my own voice and create my own narrative, which is the true narrative of who I am. And I think that the only way to do that is to really have those connections with other people and to um, you know, use my voice in a way that I normally wouldn't. And being able to meet a group of people like we did and in that kind of environment, it was like the special, it was like a special circumstance for us all to really bond. And you couldn't, there was no pretending there. Your true colors came out. And so I think I really was happy for that part of the experience. But meeting people like you and having that supportive community and also congratulations on winning the whole damn thing. Um <laughs> I just think that that goes to show like how these experiences you think you would never do come out being one of the best ones you could have ever had. Yeah. I mean, it was so impactful for me, but um, it was really cool to see just everyone stripped down fully. Like there's no, Literally. there's no way you can pretend to be anything other than just who you are. Cause you're just like, I need to survive. Um, I am, there is nothing that I can do, put up any type of walls right now. And it was just really special. And I, uh, it, that is just who you are. And so I'm excited and so proud of you for everything that's coming up and all the things that we're going to discuss today of all the new projects. And, um, 
just really, I, I want to rally around you because I've just seen the type of person that you really are <laughs> in those moments. But I do want to so ask sweet. what, what made you say yes to special forces? Was it to, to be able to show this different side of you or was there any other reason why you're like, I want to do the show? Well, there was a couple things. Like the first time that they mentioned this to me, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. I don't really do unscripted. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I, and two, my life has been so picked apart that like, I really mm -hmm. hate doing that. Cause like I say, or do one little wrong thing and then I'm the worst human alive. So I really was nervous about that. But at the same time, I felt like, you know what? I need to, I, who I am, I don't need to apologize for, I, for who I am. And I should just be bold enough and show my girls that it's okay to get up there and just either succeed or fail and just kind of push yourself to the limits. So for me, it was an opportunity to be Jamie Lynn, which I never really was allowed to do my whole life. I've always been a character or, you know, the backdrop. So I think for me, that was a cool opportunity and also to push myself. And that was the first time I left both of my children. So as a mom, there was a lot of levels personally, um, as a mother, as a professional, there was a lot of things that I was pushing myself and just said, you know, what, the only way to do it is to do it. And two, I really was excited about the community of meeting people from all different walks and parts of the world and the industry and whatever athletes I mean the athletes and so I think for me it was all of that put into one I was like what a rare circumstance that we get to do this and then going all the way to another country and really just seeing what you're made of so for me it was all of that into one yeah the sa same I think it was especially being the first season we didn't really know what to expect um yeah so I think the more I've, we've talked to the cast I think everybody just wanted to put themselves in out of their comfort ship, out of their comfort zone and to really show what we're made of. And uh, I think it, it was just an awesome experience for me. I wanted to talk about um, our first, uh, what, what, what do we call them? First task when oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. had to jump out of the helicopter. And I remember you yeah. had that very strong reaction to the first task because it brought you back yeah. to Maddie's accident. Were you surprised by those emotions that came up? Oh my gosh. It caught me so off guard. I'm really good at like kind of bottling things up. And I just think that something about it's, it's like your body remembers trauma. And that was something mm -hmm. that I guess I'd never really put together of like doing something that not only emotionally, I probably could have bottled down, like watching someone else do it. But then when your body physically feels that same kind of like trauma of swimming, it wasn't necessarily the dive out of the helicopter, it was the swimming back to the thing. Mm -hmm. Because in my daughter's accident, getting out of the water and like feeling like you kept going up and under, I just something about that. And then climbing out and that same kind of adrenaline letdown, it was like such a familiar feeling to me that my body just was like, it just release so I couldn't stop crying and it wasn't even like I was sad it was like my body was just releasing something and it really was a moment for me to say you know crying's not weakness I'm not sad about anything I don't feel defeated even if I didn't you know technically pass the task my body is it's it's releasing something it felt really good to do that and so I just sat there and cried the whole time because I don't think that I'd really and how else in the world would I've ever been in another circumstance where you're truly swimming in for your life. Like, Oh my gosh, I'm so far away. When else is that going to happen? It was a good thing. I feel like, cause anytime you're releasing yeah. those emotions, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. And I, well, you said something about like, you are, you are not weak at all. And I remember you would talk about, like you talk about certain things that have happened in your life that are actually like really impactful. And you talk about it in such a, a way, almost like nonchalantly. So yeah, to see you have that moment of no, like this really impacted me. This was really hard for me. And I'm just, I'm going to allow myself to feel that. Have you continued to allow yourself to like, feel certain feelings, whatever that is, if that's sadness being let down, um, disappointed, like, has that been something after that moment that, that you took away from the experience at all? Or is it a journey <laughs> to get there? 
I really think that like, I was obviously not there for nearly as long as like you were or anything, but it did not matter because I took so much out of just that short time I was there of being like, I just felt so much more like strong and who I was and how I felt as far as being like, it's this, that was the craziest thing to ever do. If I could do that, like what else could I, you know, what else would I really be afraid of? And so I walked away from it saying that I, I'm fine with feeling these emotions and being exactly who I am. And I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. And I'm not going to pretend to be perfect. And just like you said, I do have a way of kind of nonchalantly talking about things that are really heavy because that's how I was kind of always trained to just, it felt it was easier for me to, to, to do that than to really go there or let act like anything affects me. And so I think that that whole year along with special forces was the, like that whole year was about me personally, just being open and honest and as raw as I could be with my whole life. And I did that and it felt really good, but it's also one of those things that like, I now feel like I'm in a place where I'm okay with doing that because I did just let it all hang out there and it's not the end of the world if I do, but it allows me to move forward. I feel like I was hanging on to so much. It was like, I couldn't move forward because I was still digging from that well that I was holding on to, I guess. Yeah. I think it's so crazy how, even though it was like such a short amount of time, how much growth and how, how impactful it, it has been ever since for everyone's life. Like just having that one moment for you, how it's allowed you almost that freedom to feel, to feel like you're validated in some way for, to express any type of emotion. And I can really see that in you. And it's so cool. Also, I think just your transformation watching as someone that was also experienced from when I first met you, I thought you were more going to be like, you were a little bit more reserved kind of to yourself. And I remember you, you had, you always had your glasses on and I was like, Oh, is she like going to want to do this? But it was just immediately when we started, I'm like, that is, she's a girl. I want to be around her the whole time. And you just made me laugh. And even when you, like you said, you, you would fail a task and it's like, so what? Like you just had this tenacity about you. And I'm sure that has come from having to have that in your life. Me, To me. Yeah. I mean, like to me, like there's no time to dwell on it. A lot of things are not in my control. I'm just kind of a survivor. I'm just going to the next thing and figuring it out because what other choice do I have? But for me doing the task at all was a win. So like, to me, it wasn't about someone telling me, hey, you passed. It was like, I did this thing that like, I never would have thought I could do. That was a win. It was like a personal win to me. And two, when I first got there, I was so intimidated about meeting everybody too. Like, so I was really shy and really reserved. I was like, oh my God, I just felt like I felt so shy. And I think that some people think that like, that means we're rude or we're something, but I was just like, oh my God, like this person did this and this person did this. And this, like, I was so afraid of everyone. Genuinely. Isn't so funny because I yeah. felt the same way. I think everybody yeah. now, like, as we've talked, felt the same way. You're intimidated because you are around all these people who have excelled in whatever like lane they're in. And yeah. For me, like I've always, like, we'll get into it. Like Zoe 101, all that. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Jamie Lynn Spears. Like, I think every girl my age was jealous and wanted to be you. And it's like, (laughs) I mean, it was like, that's Jamie Lynn Spears. She's on the show. And also just like the way that, you know, the media has, has said different things about you. And it's like, I, yeah, it was just so interesting to see like that first night when we all kind of met how everybody was like to themselves. And then here you are the girl that (laughs) two days later, you are Diddy recruit and you are running around without a bra on doing this, the worst (laughs) beasting we ever had. I I need you to tell this story because it's, it is the funniest thing to me. Uh, when yes. so the very first night the fir- very first day Jamie Lynn is the duty recruit which <laughs> I remember being like oh bless Jamie's heart because we have no idea what we're doing and, and she I has no to voice. Be like, <laughs> <laughs> I lost my voice and I'm not telling that I'm like this to me Jamie Lynn has no voice and she had to scream for everyone. Like she would have to go up to this rock and scream up to like the tower staff. And she, and you couldn't. 
So it was and like he got mad at me for that. <laughs> and then I remember I couldn't he couldn't hear me because I couldn't say the words and I was like so then he came out and whenever I'm about to cry sometimes I yawned. So I was like oh, and he's like am I am I boring you? I was like no. <laughs> I just was like, it was just like a, a wave after wave of just like, oh my God, this is not going on. But you handled it like a beast. Like you really let everything like roll off your back. But I, I need you to tell the story of like what happened. And I feel like they didn't show why you were didn't. so frazzled <laughs> going into that. I'm sorry. I can't help but laugh because I'm just seeing like images in my head of you're just getting out of the shower. <laughs> Literally. And I was, because I was the person who was like the, I was the number one, whatever they called it. I was the duty recruiter. recruiter. I, yeah. So I was the one who like had to make sure everybody got everything they needed. So I was like, I'll shower last because like everyone showers. I make sure. Blah, blah. So we do that, but you know, we had a wet set of clothes and a dry set of clothes. And so, I had just put on like a dry shirt or something. I don't know. I just gotten out of the shower and it's like 11 o'clock at night, mind you. So I'm letting my things dry, which include your sports bra and things of such. So I go to like lay down. I mean, like, I don't even know. Was I even laying down or was I still at the shower? I'm not sure. I think you and they're like, like just getting out like in your, I don't think you were dressed at all. Like, I don't think so, I don't think so either. I, I don't know, but all I know is like I was most definitely like getting ready to lay down for what three hours and maybe get back up again. When all of a sudden we hear, Daddy recruit, come out here, do your little stones or whatever. You know, we had to go stand on our stones. And then I'm thinking in my head, okay, like I don't know how long it's gonna be. Maybe they're gonna like yell at us and make us do some push ups or something. Oh no. Oh no. We had to go through a whole <laughs> obstacle course and they don't even show you that thing. They like breeze over that. That was horrible. I was like, a, it was an hour long, like, workout like crossfit biking everything you could imagine kind of workout all into one and the whole time i don't have a bra on because i didn't have time to put one on and then they're like dive in the water and i'm like <laughs> okay guys like i don't know how to tell the recruit this and then we go to all line up at the end we finally finish this and we're going to line up at the end and everybody's like jangling put your hands what what do they want me to do with my hands they we had to put, put them side. down by our sides that you're obviously I was like, I, was like, <clears throat> I, was like I, I can't do that and they were like put them by your side and I was like oh. I don't know exactly what I said but essentially I was like I don't have a bra on like I cannot do that <laughs> and these men are like <laughs> I was like just like what do you want me to say like I don't know what I didn't know any more polite way to say it and I really I, I don't I mean because at the time like that's the last thing on my mind because when you're there you're really in it you know it's like okay, I guess this is what I'm doing now on national television. <laughs> like, whatever you guys. I, I mean, it was, I felt for you because I remember I'm also, I take my time. I'm always late for things. And I was always stressed yeah. because you never knew when they were going to come in. That was and, the worst. And tell, be like, get up, go do something. And I had also just changed. I thought, oh, we're surely done for the night because we had done so much. I thought so much. So I'm gonna like I'm gonna go ahead and get in my dry set. Which, for those of you who have haven't watched the show, go watch the show. But um, our wet kit was what we were supposed to like. Anytime we were doing task wear, and then we always had this dry kit so that we could wear it to sleep at night. It was always more like clean. If something happened, you always like if if this was real life and we were um, special forces people, if we got in a bad situation where it's cold and wet, we would have an extra change of clothes that would save our lives. So that was the reason we had wet and dry, but it's our first night there. So I'm thinking, oh, we're done. I'm in my clean clothes. Oh my gosh. And Jamie Lynn's right. Like why am I, I'm talking like to people and also you at the same time. <laughs> But no, I understand because it's, it's like you try to make people understand. I need people to understand that like it was a five second clip. It felt like of what was absolute torture. That was horrible. Yes. That first night was horrible. When they glean when they just skipped over that, I was like, oh, oh, really? <laughs> I've never oh, had a harder workout too. in my life. Literally, and, we were on the monkey bar 3000 times, like blisters. I was like. I mean, and it sounds silly, like the monkey bar is a playground. No, no, no. Not after you've already jumped over a five-foot wall. No. So, I, totally. 
Adam, my boyfriend. And I was in a group with like the like the super athletes too. I was in there with like Carly, Danny, um, and Dwight. I was like, oh really? <laughs> no. I was like, really? I just saw you in here with the Olympic people. <laughs> but yeah, we were watching it. We were watching it again last night and Adam was like, yeah, it just looks like it just makes you want to laugh. Like you don't see how hard it is. And I'm like, I hope this next yeah. round, they really show more this because they're having a new season coming. Um, those moments, because those were sometimes the yeah. worst were like the things that they just like it was an obstacle obstacle course. It was not. Um, I agree. Like, I think that one thing that they really should show more of is the fact that like being at the camp was actually sometimes the hardest parts going to the task. At least you knew like we're going to this place and we're doing it was like the only time you kind of knew what the framework was going to be. But when you were at the camp, you're like, when are they going to ask me to do this? And like, just, you're not like, oh, I need to go pee, but it's disgusting. And it was just like sitting at the camp was truly like the worst part. 1000%. That's what I tell people when they're like, oh, how was that experience doing this wild, crazy thing up in the air? I'm like, I would rather have done that all day and not had to go back to that camp because you're just always on edge, disgusting. So I totally agree with you. I just want to talk about one other thing about um, you really struggled with being away from your girls and I'm not a mother. So I, I couldn't fully understand that, but where do you think, why was that so hard for you to be away from them? I mean, I guess I kind of, I kind of understand, but not fully. I will say this, looking back, I wish I would have made myself stay. I do wish Mm -hmm. that, like, I'm fully able to admit that I regret. I know I could have done the task. The task was not the issue for me. It was the mental side for Mm -hmm. me of saying, I'm over here doing this when my kids are at home. And I also was getting ready to go shoot Sweet Magnolias not too long after that. And as a mom, especially in the kind of work where you travel a lot and stuff, you just start to feel guilty. Like I should be there with my kids. Like they didn't ask for a mom to be gone and they did. And it was my first time leaving my little one who at the time I think was like almost four. And it was just mom guilt. Just every mom can, it, it can it totally relate to having mom guilt. And I think that that's something that I'm much after that trip, truly am much better at and now appreciate, you know, what time that I do have just as me as a mom. And I do wish I would have made myself stay, but it's just, there's unexplainable mom guilt. And then we were so far away that Mm -hmm. all I could think about was like, not only when I decided to leave, but I've got like a whole nother two day trip home. So I just think there was a lot of like control, like the control freak in me, the anxiety part of myself was just taking over and not allowing me to be fully present, which if I were to ever have the chance to do it again, I would be like, don't let me talk about my kids. Like I love my kids. Everyone knows I love my kids, but I just need to step out of that and kind of push myself to be here and be more present. And that was something else I learned was like, yeah. look, your kids are going to be okay. You need to really take this moment because it wasn't necessarily the task. It was the mental part that I just really mm-hmm. couldn't get past the fact that I was away from my kids. I don't know why I felt so extremely guilty because from an outsider looking in, I'm like, how'd you feel guilty about that? You know? But I also think that, Um, I know my parents worked away or starting businesses while I was young. And I can remember feeling like being scared if they were not going to come, come home. And I wonder, did, I mean, your parents obviously were away a lot, um, working on their own, helping with your sister's career. Do you feel like maybe those, did you have those same feelings as a kid sometimes? And do you think maybe that um, maybe rubbed off on the way that you felt of as a parent leaving your kids for so long? 100%. I think of everything that we do stems from something we've experienced in our own childhood. And for me, my mom was a wonderful mom. She really was. But I can't imagine being in a situation where you do have another child who's traveling the world and is homesick and wants her mom. So you want to go be with her. And my dad wasn't as much in my life as when I was younger. So I would go stay with a friend and be with them. And I always kind of felt guilty being at a friend's house for a certain period of time when my mom would be gone. So I always think that I remember feeling like I just want to be home. And I just, even though my kids are at home with their dad, it's, it's still, I just, that sense of me feeling like I wish my mom was here. I don't want to be with anybody else. That plays into my narrative, even though my kids are like, you know, you're here. We know that you go to work, you come back. 
it's still just innately in me to feel that guilt because, you know, when my mom would be gone for periods of time, you don't have the understanding as a child to be like, well, she has to, and she has another kid or whatever. And I just felt like I wanted my mom there. And so I never want my kids to feel that. So of course I overcompensate in my own way of, you know, making up reasons to feel guilty, to get back home. And it's a true thing you feel in your gut as a mom. It's not something you're doing as an excuse. It's like you truly are just like, just battling it the whole time. No, I, I had, I understand that a lot more. I actually talked to a friend who was considering going on this next season and ultimately why she didn't is because of her babies too. Like, I don't think what you yeah. experienced a lot of the other moms that were on the show were also feeling it. Um, and yeah. she, she said to me, she's like, children experience time differently too, which is so uh-huh. true, especially like you said, with your three-year-old, like she, de- she didn't understand as much uh-huh. with time. And so it really gave me like, oh, I think, you know, if I had kids, I would have struggled with that because I also like every, every decision you make comes from something that you experienced yourself. And for me, uh-huh. I remember being so upset. All I wanted was my mom. And I can remember my babysitters or the nanny or whoever was picking us up. And I'm like, Oh, I don't want you. I want my mom. So yeah. I think there's definitely some grace there. I know you said that like, it's maybe something you might've changed, but I also think it makes a lot of sense as to why you wanted to be, you wanted to be back with your babies. And I really also admire that. Cause I think you're a really awesome mom. Thank you. Uh, but yeah. I think it's finding that balance, but also just honoring what you feel, but to Every mom, like that's the part they don't tell you when you give birth, you instantly, you're going to feel guilty the rest of your life. Just, you're going to be worried and guilty (laughs) the whole rest of your life. doesn't matter what you do. You're going to the bathroom and leave your kid in the crib and you're like, oh my God, why did I do that? You know, it's just the minute your child is born, worry and guilt just are part of your life and that never changes. Perfect. Can't wait. (laughs) Yeah. And you do love them a lot. That's good. Yeah. (laughs) But that's why you feel all those feelings is because it's, what yeah. I've heard is like this total different type of love that, um, yeah, that you can't understand until you've you've had your own child. But I want to talk yeah. about what your childhood was like because it's obviously a lot different, probably than mine. But I'm sure there are some similarities. But when you think back on your childhood, like how do you remember it? Well, yeah, I always I think that I did have a very different childhood. But the one thing that I do appreciate was that my mom and me, like I would go shoot Zoe and do that in the summers, but we always came back and lived in Louisiana. So that way home base was always Louisiana. I never pulled out of like my school would send my work to set for my school teacher to do there. So I was still on track with my school. I got to go back home and be a cheerleader. I got to, you know, I would, and I remember I always hated because I'd miss like the beginning of the year, like, um, you know, jamboree thing where all the football players and they're there the cheerleaders but for me my childhood was all I mean there was complicated parts to it of course because that's a complex world being the entertainment industry as a young child and your whole family to basically be in it Mm -hmm. um but for me I do think we did the best we could do when I look at it from from my mom's point of view who's really kind of the parent carrying all the weight of you know parenting her children so I think for me like she was just doing the best that she could and really did her best to give me like the best of both worlds um being able Mm -hmm. to you know go to my school and also do what I love to do because as a child you're gonna be resentful when you're working and you feel like you should be able to do whatever you want but at the same time you want to be home it's like a really weird complicated feeling as a young like child did you know that you were different or did you feel normal like how did did your mom help you feel as normal as you could in your life or was it very evident you're like hmm we live a lot differently than everybody else yeah I mean we definitely well you know I grew up for like the first I think you know the real stardom and big part of you know um my older sibling success it really was basically when I was like seven or eight maybe Mm -hmm. And because we lived in like the Mickey Mouse Club world for a while, like I kind of just thought like, oh, oh, this is just entertaining. And like I would love to entertaining too. I always 
always wanted to act. It's all I ever wanted to do. I, I forced my friends to be in movies that I'd film on my video camera. You know, it was like, that was, I just thought we we're just this kind of family who this is what we do. This is what we love to do. And this is how we bonded too. We did it together. And I know that growing up, I think it would have been very different if I didn't grow up in a town where the same kids that I went to kindergarten with were the same kids that I was in high school with. So these were people I grew up with from a very young age and they knew, of course, that, you know, I was on TV and my family was famous, but they'd grown up knowing me since I was younger. So it was a little bit different as opposed to, I think, if I were in LA and it was like a different, it, kids look at it differently whenever they, I feel like, you know, that's where the entertainment business is. It does mean something different there. My teachers and stuff, they didn't really care about it. Like they were so annoyed that I would do my math homework the wrong way because I was taught a different way in LA. Like that was more concerning to them than like, whatever TV show I was doing. So I do think that that was a really big part of it. But there, of course, were moments where we'd go play other schools and the other schools would treat me differently. Like they Mm -hmm. would sing the Zoe theme song in the student section, the whole bleachers. You know how embarrassing that was? It's like a cheerleader. I'm like (laughs) down here and I just want to blend in and they're like all singing the Zoe theme song in the bleachers. So those moments would be like, but then my little community would really be protective of me. So I think it was kind of, it was, it was a really a blessing that I was able to be in a community that I grew up in. I think that was a really smart decision. Just seeing now having friends and knowing more people in the industry of your mom, allowing you to stay in school, to have those friends, like you said, from, you know, kindergarten to graduating, because I feel like those people keep you so humble and moving now for me, I just moved back to the South to Nashville. And it's been so refreshing to be around people who don't care at all about who I am to anybody else. Um, and how other people view me, they just know the real Hannah and they love that side. And it's, it feels so good. And to know that you had that through all the, the ups and downs and celebrations of your career, I think is really, I would think had helped a lot. Um, And I think it's cool that you, that you had like, I don't know. I just think it's really cool that your parents allowed you to like have that live in Louisiana, but then also be able to go do your thing. Um, Because I don't know if that's always, it doesn't seem like the way most people handle it nowadays I mean it was harder but it was also I really wanted that I was a kid who got I really got homesick Mm -hmm. but I just think that was maybe coming from the fact that even from a young age we traveled as a family and I missed out on a lot of things like that my friends got to do and I really really wanted that I craved that normalcy more than anything but you know when you're a kid a lot of that's not in your control so I just think that as I was able to voice that when I got older and I was working and that was the biggest you know, selling point to me was that I could go home during the school year. Yeah. Did you have other than acting? Did you have any other interests and hobbies as a child that you were super involved in? Um, yeah, I mean, I played sports for like all the school teams and I really loved playing you know, basketball, softball, all those things, but and gymnastics. And then as I got older, that gymnastics went into like cheerleading gymnastics. And Mm -hmm. so we did competitive cheerleading, but the team that I was on, we always just did good enough to qualify to go to Disney world so that we could go (laughs) to Disney world competitions and get, and then we got to Disney world. We're like, who cares? We're here at Disney world. Like we always (laughs) dropped a stun at the Disney world competitions and everything, but you got to go on this Disney trip where they treated all the cheerleaders. Like we had a night at the park with just the cheerleaders and just, you know, like, so those kind of things, were, yeah, I was always an athlete growing up, but then as I got older and I was working more and it becomes more serious, you know, where they practice in the summertime. And if you're not there for summer practice, you're not going to play in the year. And so I just had to drop a lot of the sports because I'd be working in the summer. And yeah. that's not fair to me or to the team if I'm missing all of summer practice and then just hopping back in. So that was one thing that was hard to kind of have to, you know, fall behind in it, but then also just ultimately have to give it up. But it, you know, it was, for something I love to do. So I had to weigh those pros and cons at a young age and, and, you know, I think it all worked out the way it was supposed to, but that was, that was hard. Yeah. I mean, I'm just impressed that you were able to even just juggle all that 
for as long as you did. I mean, I, I didn't grow up playing any sports. I danced and that was like all that I did. So to hear that you're like, you were on TV, you're have like your own show and you're playing basketball, softball, cheerleading, like that is really impressive that you were able. I mean, I didn't say I was great at any of it, but I was (laughs) definitely on the team. (laughs) Hey, you you were good enough to make the team. That's what matters. And so, and I loved it. You know, I loved, you know, it it was all about being with my friends and doing the normal things. Like I craved that so Mm -hmm. much. Uh, So you said that you dropped all that for something that you loved. What Mm -hmm. was and how did you get into your first acting job? Well, I, my first official, I did a lot of commercials. (laughs) Like I did local commercials. I did state commercials. And then my first big booking was a Clorox commercial. And I remember thinking, well, I am a superstar now. Like, this is it. Like, I just remember, like, Clorox. Everyone knows Clorox. I'm going to be so famous. And obviously, that was not the case. But it was, like, you know, a real shoot. And it was shot in New Orleans because my agent, you know, I'd go on local auditions. It didn't matter what it was. I would go audition for anything. I did the school plays. I did all of that. Like, I just wanted to be in front of the camera. And um, I did the Clorox commercial. And then I got, well, my mom and them were contacted about me trying out for a show on Nickelodeon called all that. And I was like, Oh my God, like that is my dream kind of show. You know, it's like kids Saturday night live. So I was sent some scripts of, you know, some different little segments that I had to learn and act out. This is the days of when you still went in and like you actually were in front of like the producers and then the camera. And then you also had to bring in an original character that you made up on your own. And you had to do that and kind of like ad lib. Well, I'd always done this character that was a combination of my granny Lexi, who was this old lady who was kind of mean and she owned a seafood restaurant. (laughs) We loved her. And then, (laughs) and then um, a security guard named Big Rob, who was security for our family for years. I made it this old lady security guard. And I would go around doing this character all the time while we were, you know, traveling the world, whatever it was. It was just something fun I did. I called her Louise and Gillicuddy. But they ended up changing her name to Thelma Stump because of legal reasons. But that's what I tried out with for all that. And when I went in, I did that character. And they ended up making a skit on the show. But they oh, I know, making good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and like, there was a lot of things like that. But yeah, so I remember I went in, I tried out and I did my best. And I was really nervous. And then when I got that call that I booked all that, that was like, oh my gosh. Like I, that was my dream come true. I loved the show. I got to actually be on the show. And then too, to have them like the character you walked in with, like it was every dream I ever had coming true, but that was my first real booking and that led into Zoe. And so that was kind of really the first big thing I ever really booked. I'm so glad you brought up all that because that is when I was like, I want to be Jamie Lynn Spears because (laughs) You're so, you're so, you're so funny on that. Like as a kid, like legitimately funny. It wasn't like just some like corny thing. Like the, the grandma, what was her, Thelma Stump. Thelma Stump. Such a good character. And I think that's so cool. I did not know that you came up with that character because for me personally, that was my favorite role that you played. Was that your favorite role? Yes, it was because it was my granny. It was like about my granny, you know, and it was like just, everything and then too I got to wear like this fake they were she had like these old lady boots and they were bird seed and like I had no I had no breast at that time and I loved it I loved walking <laughs> around and throwing them around I mean it was the most fun thing in the whole entire world I mean I was like 11 years 10 or 11 years old and that to me was my favorite one to do and too because the guests that was always too they'd always have it being some guests trying to come in the show so I got to do it with a lot of like people that I'd never met people I do you know it was just it was a fun it was a fun storyline, but it was also like fun to know that it meant a lot to me to be able to have that. And, and I liked being funny. And I, and I think that that's one thing that actually I'm really excited about with Zoe is that in this new movie, it's a comedy. People are going to laugh. Like it's really funny. And I hadn't really gotten to do anything like that since like the, all that in the Zoe days. And that's really what introduced me to it and gave me confidence to be able to do it in the first place. No, like you shine in, in that, in, <laughs> playing comedic roles and so when I was getting ready for our interview and like going back and watching I'm like this is amazing and yeah for me Thelma Stump Stump was the best so I love 
I love to know now the backstory of that, that you came up with that. It's really badass, first of all. But it's true. It's like, really, like, I can't believe, like, I was just so bold enough at that age, like, walk in there and do that. But then, like, a couple years ago, we did, like, a little mini reunion of the cast and Zoe. And I had to play Thelma Stump as an adult. And I was like, I'm so mortified <laughs> while I did this character. <laughs> but I did it because I was like, how am I not going to do it? You know, literally had to be with my castmates acting like an old lady. I was like, oh, I'm mortified. But you know what? It's like true to how it all started for me. Isn't that so interesting? I think back on my younger self, like the boldness and the willingness to just go for it and how that we kind of like lose that as we get older. Yeah. And I, I wonder why that is. I, I guess it, do you know why that is? I don't really know. Only thing I can think of is that because being as I, you know, I was a songwriter in Nashville. I am a songwriter, but you get in these rooms around people. And I think it's even in high school, you get in these rooms around kids that are older than you, whatever it is. And you walk in and you think, everything's a great idea and everything's wonderful. And the first time somebody like kind of, or somebody you look up to or something says, maybe, uh, I don't know about that. And that feeling, it starts to carry over into every other thing where you're like, Oh, like, I don't, I don't want to feel that way anymore. It's like, I think it's something about some people maybe aren't as affected by that, but I'm a people pleaser. And I want to be good. Yeah. It, it feels like rejection and, and to protect yourself from that, you play it safe. And the thing is, is if you're going to go big, you're going to have rejection. And playing it safe feels good because you're likely not to receive rejection. But the only way to, you know, do something great is to have that obvious fear of being rejected. So I think that's our childlike thing that we really should hang on to. I agree. I remember when I first, I mean, my story is just weird of how I got to be the bachelorette. Like I was literally just a girl in a small town. Like I always had these dreams of doing things and like looked up to um, other people like my age that were that started out young acting. I always wanted to do that, but my parents didn't really facilitate that at that age. I don't think they knew yeah. how. And first of all, we didn't know anyone else doing that. And then I get to this place where I am like on these uh, sets and I, at first, like, I didn't know, I just didn't know to be nervous. It's like, oh yeah, exactly. have you ever read a teleprompter before? I'm like, no, but I'll try it. And I did great. I did great, but I, it's now that I've done it enough and I've been on more sets and I'm like, oh, you should be, you should in quotes, be a little bit more nervous or prepared. And that is what takes away that shine of what makes exactly. us good at what we do. Um, exactly. I think that's why I've like literally the whole world fell in love with you is because you were so genuine and pure. And like, that is something you cannot manufacture. That's just genuine. And that is why you probably are still successful and people still care about you because of the fact that you have been genuine since day one. So it might've been a gift that you weren't trained up in a certain way, because then you kind of have to start to break that back down. Like I did, you know, it's like, you as a person are what is endearing and that shouldn't be, you know, no one should frown upon that. The mistakes and all of it, as long as it's genuine, that's really all that matters. And I think that, you know, that's kudos to you for just doing that and doing it, you know, not when you were 12 years old, doing it a little bit later is probably what makes it so much, you know, more captivating. Well, thank you. But I also see that resurgence in you as well. Like, in this time you're, you know, you had Zoe 101. Now you're, oh gosh, I don't know how many years later it is. And to hear you talk about it being a comedy and kind of going back to like, what made you so lovable? How has that been to be able to play that character again? And do you feel like you almost were able to, to go back to that lightness of, of being Zoe all these years after now being a mom and going through all these different life stages. Yeah. I think that Zoe was a part of my childhood. I grew up with the people I made it with. I grew up being her. I've put parts of myself in her when we were creating the show. It was really important to me that she was a tomboy, that she could do anything boys could do. Like I really put a lot of myself into Zoe. And so being able to play her again felt, like coming home. It really, really did. It 
it was better this time to me than it was even as a child, even working with my castmates. I feel like we bonded on a whole new level. You know, you take all those insecurities away of teenagers and all those things. And we're really able to like love and support each other and get to know each other as adults. That was wonderful. But also too, it reminded me like why I love what I'm doing and why, and why, why would I not embrace that fully? And I think that for me, it's like, I've always just tried to play it safe and do what everyone else tells me to do. And this was something that, you know, we really worked hard to bring together. Um, I'm an executive producer on it. And I was able to like open up a lot of doors that I just wasn't sure if I was capable of doing anymore. You know, you lose that belief in yourself sometimes. But when I started Soup Magnolias, that kind of gave me that confidence again. And then it just continued to roll over into bringing the Zoe world back together. Like I could cry every time I think of it. Cause I'm like, I can't believe that we did this and I can't believe that I was fortunate enough to get to do this again. And I really think it's better than anyone's ever going to even imagine. It is so good. The movie truly is the writers, Monica and Maddie just wrote this story because they were fans of Zoe. And so they wrote kind of what they know the fans would want. There's so many Easter eggs in there. I'm telling you, bringing Zoe back to life brought me back to life. It really, really did. I can see that and, and hear that just in your voice when you talk about it. But I will say, I knew that you were planning on doing, you'd kind of told us about that Zoe was coming back, but Mm -hmm. watching the trailer, it looks really good. Like I'm genuinely excited to watch. I'm like, okay, this is how you make a comeback to a show where you still have that. um, You still like feel those characters, but you really are making them adults. Like it's, it feels like this is something that I'm going to enjoy. Um, now at my age and it's not like you just went all the way back to only where like a you know 14 year old's going to enjoy this like it really exactly. looks like something that I'm going to be able to resonate and like I said when I watched Zoe I saw a lot of myself in that character and I will continue to see myself I I, I would think in what I'm seeing from the trailer in Zoe now as she's trying to figure out love in her 20s so I'm super yeah, pumped about it, is. it. it's it's honestly, I will say that was the biggest thing for me was like Zoe, the original Zoe, she always had all the answers. Everything was always wrapped up in a bow and, it, you know, whatever. I wanted to really show not just the 14 year olds, but like the Zoe fans who grew up also grew up with Zoe. So it's like they're adults now. What would they want to see on camera? Where are they at in their lives? Let's stop telling them they have to have their stuff together because we don't always have our stuff together. And Zoe's a bit of a chaotic mess and she's figuring it out. <laughs> And so I just think that that was really fun to go there and be there and feel like we're honoring the original Zoe, but also making sure that we are very much aware of the current state of where the world is and where our age, you know, where our demographic, our, our generation is. It's, it's a complicated time to be a 20 year old. It really is. No, I am so excited for that uh, Zoe 102 to come out and it comes out July 27th, correct? Yes, it comes out July 27th on Paramount Plus. But you also have still, uh, I always say still Magnolias because that's one of my favorite movies. A lot of people do. It's mine too. I love that movie. Sweet Magnolias season three is also starting July July 20th. 20th. Yes. Okay. And that is the role that got you back into acting after like 12 years. What did you miss (laughs) acting or was it something about the role that you're like, I have to do this? Or were you already ready to jump <clears> into <throat> whatever kind of came your way? Or was it just this role as Noreen that you're like, I have to do this? Well, it's actually one I really believe is like a God thing. So mm-hmm. I think sometimes, you know, the planets and everything else align and it just works out the way it's supposed to. Number one, I had Ivy. Ivy was about a year old and I was going, I was in town in LA having meetings with a lot of different people, just kind of being like, I'm ready to go back to work and, um, talking about some different projects and stuff. And I went in to meet with Netflix and I was sitting down meeting with, um, them and they were like, Hey, we have this show that is going into production in like three weeks. Would you be interested in reading for a part? It's not a lead role. They're like, but we just really, you're so Southern in the room. Like, you know, they have like, it's different in the room. Like you're very, like we really think this would be a great part for you. I was like, yes, of course. I've missed acting so much. There just was never a role that made sense for me to come back to. But Noreen really made sense for me because 
I loved the fact that she was only supposed to be a one season character. Really? But after, yeah, after the first season, um, you know, they wrote me into the next season and I had to still, so once, once she was like, Hey, we'd love for you to read for this part. I was like, Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. I was going to get to read for a part. You know, I've been reading for parts, just never booked anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I read for it and then I met with the executive producers and I booked the job. So like two, three weeks later, I was like flying out there to go do this part. With my, I'm still breastfeeding Ivy, me and my mom and my little one. And then my husband's got Maddie at home. I go out there and I do it. And I loved Noreen because everyone wants to hate her because she's the mistress. Mm. And then you realize that she's also just a young girl trying to do her best. And we all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. Don't judge a book by its cover. And I connected so much with that. And I really wanted to bring that other side to where people understood that there's so much more than she's not just this mistress. She was a young girl, thought she was in love and was very naive. And now she's doing the best she can with the knowledge that she has. And so I think that that to me was like a godsend that I got to play that character. And now we're on season three, comes out July 20th. And I have to say, I've made a whole other family and friends in that. Joe, the lead actress on the show is like, she taught me everything about how to be a lead actress. Like she's mm. so humble, so graceful, so professional. She's become a great friend. And I just think that that was exactly what I needed before I could really go into any other role. I don't think I could have done Zoe without doing Sweet Magnolias first. And now they're coming out in the same week. And it's just like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm, I'm extremely blessed to be where I am. And I love both of the characters that I'm playing. And you don't always get to say that, but mm -hmm. I genuinely love Noreen and obviously love Zoe. It makes me so happy and almost like emotional when you're talking about this Noreen character and why you decided to take that role, because you can definitely see a parallel, especially now having a more personal connection with you. Mm -hmm. I love that you get to play this character because yeah. just hearing you talk about it and knowing that there are some parallels in your life, you stopped acting after you became pregnant with Maddie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Maddie is now, how old is she now? 15. 15. Yeah. I'm but like, I, I don't know. I cry now. I used to not cry. <laughs> But I, I just, cry now in interviews and I'm like, stop crying in interviews. I, know, I, can't like, I just, oh, like knowing you and then like reading your story and like listening. I'm sorry. I don't cry. Like this is crazy, cry. but I just, um, now and knowing how, of like what type of mom you are and Maddie's 15 and seeing Maddie at the age that you are, when you were so ridiculed. How has that changed or made you parent differently? Because she's going through, I'm sure, I mean, we all go through bullies and getting our feelings hurt, but to your, your daughter, you, you see your daughter kind of at the age that you are, how has that changed the way that you parent? And also has that given you any type of feeling of compassion for yourself and all that you were going through at that age? 100%. I, I look at her and number one, I look at her and I say, both of my children, like at least at that age, I was in the business because I did it and I loved it. And I was putting myself out there, but my children truly are not, you know, that is what their mom does. So anytime that I feel that I've exposed them in any way, you feel tremendous guilt. And I try to protect them in every way that I can, but I also try to defend them in every way that I can. I won't allow untruths to just be said about me, but I also am not going to put myself out there and defend things that really should people should just know better. Mm -hmm. So I also look at the fact that when I was not much older than my daughter is now that I became pregnant. And yes, that was something that I took responsibility for the way that made sense for me. That doesn't make sense for everyone else, but it made sense for me. And the whole world came down and told me I was the worst human alive for doing so. And that every young girl who ever watched my show was going to be ruined because of me and my personal decision. Um, I take responsibility. I didn't want to let anybody down, but I had to do what was right for me. And now I look at my daughter and I just can't imagine. And, and in these times, there would never be a news cover story in every magazine in the world telling you that you are an SEO. Uh, you're a slut and your life is ruined and you're never going to be anything because of the fact that you had a baby. 
they wouldn't allow that in today's world, but that's the times we were in. And I am just so thankful that my 15 year old gets to see her mother working, doing what she loves and anything that she reads the contrary, because she would take that on. as like, wait, what do you mean? I ruined your life. What do you mean? Why would they say that, Mama? Oh, she, gets to, she gets to see every time somebody gives me a job, they're giving my little girl something to look up to. They're taking mm-hmm. something and doing something so much bigger. To me, I don't look at it as just working. I look at it as doing something that makes my children proud. And like, that is the biggest thing to me is that she's a 15 year old. And then my little four year old, five year old now, who doesn't even know the difference between anything. They get to see their mom working and succeeding And I was told I wasn't going to. And Mm. I don't think people ever thought about what will that little girl think if she reads that headline one day about her mother? Even if I was the worst human alive, that Mm. little girl doesn't deserve that. And so I just think overall, it's a really full circle moment to be able to, when my daughter came on set um, of Zoe, she was like, wow, mom, I can't believe all these people are here because of your show. And you did that. I'm so proud of you. And I swear to you, that was like the moment where I said, thank you, God. Like, thank you so much. That moment makes it all worth it. Uh, And I just think that that's really the biggest thing that I've taken away from all of it is like, I remember being that age and isn't it crazy that now I'm doing Zoe when my daughter's that age. I mean, that, I feel like that is like God's timing and God's redemption Yes. um, and allowing you, you've gone through so much and allowing you this sweet moment to share. Um, I know you also in your book, um, which came out in 2022, like you first start out saying that you were an oops baby and you knew that. Do you feel like, because I also, I also have a a sister that's uh, 13 years older than me. So I like, I had that age gap thing. Mm -hmm. I understand. And, um, my dad kind of like started over, but do you feel like you internalized feeling that way? And then how, especially like you said, like people didn't should have known better, but your daughter is seeing these headlines of her and that are not true of how you felt at all. How have you navigated those conversations while also kind of taking from your experience of if you had internalized anything from kind of feeling the same way in some sense? Um, I think that really you have to be open and honest. And I think sometimes like as much as it's a horrible thing that the media puts things out there, like with any regard for any of the minors involved, it also forces you to have conversations. It also forces you to, to do things head on where I feel like my daughter doesn't know anything different than this is the business her family's been in. And that's something they grow up knowing as weird as and strange as it may be. And she's able to know that that's not reality. Like the Mm -hmm. online world is not the reality that is what she lives in. And so she can't take that on because she's also seen that like 95% of it, unless it's like been spoken from your mouth is not true because she lived it, you know, it's her Mm -hmm. life. And so she's just very much, I've had to be open and honest, even when it sucks. You know, even when it really sucks. And also the hard part has been having to tell her, you cannot defend yourself in this. You cannot go out there and defend mama. You've got to just not say anything. I know you want to, but you can't because it's not your place, number one. And also you shouldn't have to. Who cares? You know the truth. And it just continues this narrative. That is one of the hardest things, I think, for families. And especially, I'm sure for Maddie, it's like people wanted to say that you were going to be like you said, like ruin your life and be weren't equipped to be a mother and should have made some other different decision. And I feel like you are just proving people wrong every step. And you can see that just, I know personally, like just by the way that you just are so involved in your children's life. But do you think, did you do you feel like you or like, I have to prove these people wrong and really step into like, I am going to be a good mother? Oh, 100%. Like for the first probably, I don't know, eight year, eight to 10 years of Maddie's life was 
I will not be a bad mother. I will go above and be, it was like obsessive. Like, and it, of course, because I love my child and I wanted to be a good mother, but I would not fail. I would not give them that satisfaction. So even if it was the hardest thing in the whole entire world at times, I was not, I was determined to not fail or not be the mom they said that I was going to be because I, it didn't matter what age I was. She didn't, she, she didn't deserve anything but a good mom. She was just a child brought into this world. And so there was no, there was no excuse good enough for me not to be, you know, it's like, just like, shut up and be a good mom. Like it's what it is. And that was a motivation for a while. It was like, don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see this. And yeah, it, it was hard sometimes, but I just think that, you know, it also was a motivation for me to make sure and hold myself accountable on all levels and sometimes maybe too much. I maybe probably did go overboard at times. What do you see as another blessing of having that time off, being able to really put your all into motherhood and how, and how that has translated and how you're stepping really back into your professional career? Well, I think that the whole world turned on me when I was just 16 because I decided to make a choice about my body as a young girl and what I want to do. And Which also that- I want to say, I feel like it's, I just, I'm sorry, I'm butting in, but it's just interesting that it's like, we're not rallying and, and wanting to help a 16 year old support someone who's making decision to bring their baby into the world. Like I'm all like for women having the right to choose what they want to do, but it was almost like you were, it seemed like people were like mad at you for bringing they were, baby into because, the world. Because essentially I was having the conversation of young girls, my age were having sex. And I think people didn't want that. Yeah. They didn't want that conversation of like, yeah, this is going on, but a lot of them are just not getting pregnant. I did get pregnant and this is what I choice I've decided to make. If I would have had an abortion, no one would have known about it, but it wouldn't have changed the fact that I had sex. Mm. So I think that was really the bigger conversation of now young girls are going to want to have sex and this are, or they are, or whatever that whole thing is. You know, I just think that I was not speaking for anyone but myself. And that was the decision I had to make. And as I would hope in today's world that they would, since there is a bit more of a understanding of letting women choose what to do with their bodies, should be um that they would have compassion for someone who chooses that option as well so I just think that like as a whole that I would hope our whole world would handle that differently but it just shows you just 15 years ago I was being shamed as a woman for making a choice about my own life and on a public scale ever I mean there was not one no one said one good thing it was just like you are the worst you've ruined everything every child now wow what a letdown you are And so I just think that like, I would hope that we would do better. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just, let's just hope that, that, that will do better. And I think that one of the biggest things for me was I, I didn't want to be in the middle of attention. I went to, I moved to Mississippi in the middle of nowhere. I did not have a cell phone. I had a house phone. I was like, no one called me. I put myself on a budget. I had a budget for like 10 years that I lived very strictly by (laughs) and I just wanted to be normal and I just really wanted to be away from, it. and they still chase me down. Mm-hmm. So I think that if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have had an understanding of like what it means to be just, I guess, like, like just really interacting in the world as somebody who I, I really, I think being in a small town and going into the store and this woman who's checking you out, she does not care about who you are, what you're doing or who's taking your picture. She's trying to get home to her kids. Interacting mm-hmm. with people like that on a daily basis makes you have a much different outlook whenever a newspaper writes a bad headline about you. That's not true. You're like, you know what? Like, that doesn't matter. Like, these are the people that matter, you know? And I think that for me, it just gives you a better understanding of like how petty it really all is. Mm-hmm. I, I, that was one of the things that I'm so glad somebody told me um, when I did get, start being in the public eye. It's like, it doesn't matter what these people who've never met you before it it say about you. It's about the people that are in your life. And if they're starting to say things about you that are different than how you want to live, that's when you should worry, but it's how you show up for those people. And to my question, like, it feels like 
having that time away kind of made you, it seems like just like humbled you in a way and allowed you to be able to, I guess, just like let that stuff roll off your back to be able to step back in and really like you're shining right now. I think that what it is, is that like when you are living in that world of the public eye only, your only validation is like, am I doing well? What are they saying about me? How is that? But then when you take yourself out and you go, that is such a small little percentage of the real world. Like the rest of the, the silent majority are the people who are out there, not reading headlines, living everyday life, running behind their kids. And when you kind of take yourself out of it and you realize that like, what I do is a blessing and I get to do what I love, but the other side of it is just them doing what they have to do to sell papers or to whatever clickbait. It doesn't really matter. Don't get me wrong. I'm the first person. My team can tell you, I'll be, Oh my God, these people are saying mean things about me. Like it really hurts my feelings. But I also am like, does it really matter as long as I'm able to provide for my family and my family is happy and content? I have to tell myself that a lot. Like you have two healthy children. Mm -hmm. What else matters? And I think that coming out of that for a long time humbled me because, yes, I probably was a spoiled, bratty child actor. I probably was. I know my mom would probably agree with that <laughs> statement. So I do think that being humbled is the best thing that anyone can do because you forget about the rest of the world when you get so sucked in about what the Internet says about you. So I do think that it saved me in a lot of ways by putting me back in what, you know, 90 percent of the world is and not that small little 10 percent. You're speaking so much truth to me right now because I have also, I mean, if you're in the public eye in any way, you, you have people that are going to make up narratives and say things about you, but it's such like, you're just telling like, you're just giving me a good reminder that it is only like a small amount of people. And there's a lot of other people that are actually rooting for us behind the scenes, but don't take the time to write a mean comment. <laughs> like, they don't have time. Yeah. They're going to go see your movies and they're going to go read your book, but they're out there like living real life. They don't have time to get on the internet and do those kind of things. When I'm interacting at the ballpark, like I am now, people are coming up to me and they're so excited about this. They're so excited about that. And I'm like, yeah, that they're like me. They're running, they're working behind kids. Like those are like probably the general public. It's a luxury to be able to sit around and write mean comments like, and keep the lights on. It really mm. is. And I think that that's another reminder of like, obviously people writing hateful comments, if they feel that way, then that might be their only way they feel they can validate themselves. And I feel for them in that. But I just think that for anyone who has ever felt attacked, it's just a good reminder to like, get out in the real world. If you're feeling attacked online, go do something outside of that. And I promise you, you'll, your perspective will change very quickly. Um, and I just think that that's what, an important reminder um, when you truly have nothing, I mean, if you've done something horrible, yes. I mean, maybe, maybe there's Accountability, some for sure. that needs, you need to be accountable. And I do think that's great. But when you really know the truth about a situation and you just have to let that come to light on its own and go interact in the real world. And I promise you that people see that. And that's what matters um, the most is like real human interaction. Well, I know that from, like I said, like from being with you um, and I'm like really just impressed and thankful that special forces brought us together. And I'm also like, who, I don't know if you go to therapy, but who's your therapist? Cause they're really good. <laughs> My therapy is the good Lord. And I'm the father, son, the whole time. I'm just kidding. No. I've been to therapy. I've been through a few therapists, but yes, I do. You know what? I, I pray a lot. I got a lot of faith and I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, you know, I just think that therapy is important though. If you mm -hmm. don't have anybody to talk to, I think you've got to talk to somebody um, and really be open and honest in that, because that's one thing I've learned, like, you know, really like just kind of giving into that and letting someone see that and help you have an outside perspective is sometimes crucial to your growth. Um, and so for me that, and, you know, being able to pray and like, that's really, and, and work out a lot, <laughs> just run, <laughs> go for a run, <laughs> do a lot of that when I'm really feeling all over the place. And I will say that another thing in special forces, I will say is like, we would be going through some of the hardest moments and you always had such a good attitude that it made me realize like I can complain. Like I can be a complainer and I can you really, that. you, but you, did. you had such a light about you. And I remember thinking like, if she can do that and we're in the exact same situation, then I can do that too. And I really think that you also 
you know, that I learned that just from even my short time there from watching you and how you carried yourself through every moment. There was, you always seemed like you were at ease and you had a smile on your face. And I think that's something that was genuine. It wasn't forced. And I was like, that's something I need to work on. And I really appreciated you, you know, you being just who you were, but it was also an inspiration to be like, okay, like I need to suck it up. It's just another reminder of like, you don't have to be negative. You can be positive through the hard things. I will also credit that to therapy, <laughs> to the good Lord, yeah. because I also kind of shocked myself with how, like, I was just like, all right, let's get through it. Cause I also have those tendencies. Um, and I loved how you, you answered that and how you are so open about like how your faith and what you believe in something bigger, how it can help you through the harder yeah. times. Um, because it's really extraordinary. I think a lot of people would crumble completely with just the amount of time that you've been in the public eye, the type of conversations and criticism that's been about you, true, untrue, who cares? It's just like, that is hard. And to just hear you be so positive. And honestly, I'm like, that's why I'm like, dang, she's done some therapy. Like you really like have changed, like your perspective on life is really inspiring. And it makes me so, so excited for celebrating you and Zoe 102. I cannot wait. Everybody, we are team Zoe. We cannot wait to see her hot mess of a life. And <laughs> it's going to be so fun. And it's, of course, with Sweet Magnolias. I'm so excited about that for you. And it's so cool to be able to hear the backstory of how that character resonated with you, but also it, it obviously resonated with the um, viewers because you are, you're fully in it and how you've like changed the role of that character in this, um, in the show. It was my goal. And I was so happy that, you know, it, it, tra it, it translated. So I think for me, it's just been an overall, just like, you know, I, I just feel like I've just been really lucky and I've been really blessed. And I, I don't take any, I don't take any of this for granted. I, I really think that I have, you know, I feel like in my situation, you know, people are like, oh, be in the public eye and these kind of things. And, and it can be harmful and hateful and all of that. But I have to remember, like, I've, I've felt the tragedy of almost losing a child. Mm, that mm -hmm. is real. That's really horrible. Yeah. There are people that live that every day. So people saying untrue things about me on the internet, it, I quickly snap out of it and say, no, 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 Jamie Lynn, you don't get to do that. You got healthy kids. You've got a job. You're healthy. Shut up and be thankful. So very quickly puts you back in that reality. So I just think I'm humbled for everything that I have and I don't take any of it for granted. And how in the world do I get to do something like this that I really love? And I genuinely can't wait to for everyone to see Zoe and to see Sweet Magnolias because Sweet Magnolias is just a small town mess as usual. Surprises every episode. And Zoe is, she's right there with our generation. I'm telling you, she is, she's, she's on the struggle bus, but she figures it out because she's Zoe. Because she's Zoe. <laughs> is that uh, I want to encourage you guys, Sweet Magnolias, June, tw July 20th on Netflix season three. Then we have the long awaited Zoe 102 movie, it's going to be on Paramount Plus, July 27th. I am always rooting for you, supporting you on your team, Jamie. You. Um, I just, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to take a lot of nuggets of wisdom and truth from this conversation. So thank you so, thank so you. much for working me thank into your schedule. Me, even in my, even in this wonderful car. Thank I you wouldn't so want it any me. other way. That's why I love you. <laughs> well, I thank you. I'm so thankful we got to talk and I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Go back to watching that softball game. Hopefully it stopped raining and I'll share the live stream with you. You can watch it. Share, yeah. I mean, that's what I should do today. I'm not going to yeah. do any more work. I'm going to watch Maddie's team, not even Maddie play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'll hear her in the dugout. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Jamie Lynn. Thank you. Bye. Emma. Bye.